So starting with the first one, decline of industry and agriculture. Uh, again, you guys don't have to write all of these down. These are ideas for you. You can see I've structured it, industry and agriculture. Write your ideas under those headings, okay? We saw that in the 1920s there was a lot of success, the Roaring Twenties. Um, people were buying new things, industry, the economy, and agri you know, agricultural, I guess that's as far as the economy goes. They were all doing well. They are all making a lot of money. Um, but what we actually didn't realize at the time is that it was swelling up, I'm going to use this metaphor throughout the day, swelling up like a bubble. People thought that we were doing well um, based on what we had, status symbols, remember those that we learned about, expensive things that show, hey, I'm doing well. But in fact, the prosperity of the 20s was a false prosperity. And we'll see the Great Depression starts when that bubble that, that got big, that bur uh, that grew large and thin, burst. Okay? So as far as decline of prosperity, just kind of talked about that, uh, the bubble waiting to burst. New technologies. If you guys, we had railroads were one of the major industries, but that also involved steel, of course, and then lumber within that. That's one example where railroads were losing their um, profits because people were buying private automobiles they were riding buses. And then another example of new technologies, uh, we talk about fossil fuels like coal. The coal industry was, was huge back then. Being replaced by like hydroelectricity, which less men and in, in more greater output, it's cleaner. So these traditional um, industries are starting to decline with these newer technologies that require less people to work for them. So these old technologies are losing the profits that they once had. You combine this with the fact that during World War I, you know, a decade before, these technologies were in demand. You think about what they needed for the war. Steel manufacturing, huge. Wood, anything like that. Um, and after that, they, after the World War I, they had those high profits that actually declined, and we kind of saw the drop, the decline of that industry because of that. Now, as far as agriculture, kind of had the same problems where, you know, they were used to making large amounts of crops, or whereas industry was making um, products like, you know, cars or any, anything like that. Uh, less people started buying that. So when you're making more than people are buying for, you're losing out. So as far as agriculture, we have these farmers who are have all these surplus crops, no one to sell it to. And they have these surplus crops because they started purchasing. Put that on. They started purchasing uh, um, high-priced farming equipment in order to meet the demand that they had previously seen, you know, in the 1920s, on loans. So again, loans, credit. We talked about that uh, in the last chapter. Can anyone kind of remind me what credit means? Andrew, what does credit mean? What is credit? Buying on credit. Like, using someone else's money to pay them back later. Not, not exactly. Anyone have a... Not having to pay the whole amount at one time, so they pay in installments. And what's the one other thing that's tacked on because of that? That Interest, right? So rather than paying, yeah, rather than paying the full amount at once... They, they pay over installments, but then it costs more in the long run because they're paying interest. So we see consumers were doing this, right? Regular consumers were buying things on credit, but so were farmers as far as this equipment. And then you add that to the fact that they're, because of these new machines, they're making too many crops uh, that they can't sell. They're looking for a price support. So the very last, last part of it, the price support, it's when the government, since there's all these surplus crops, they promise and they guarantee that they will buy the farmer's crops at a certain price and then sell it later on in the world market, right? This is a good idea if, you know, the industries or the agricultural industry is bottoming out like this, the government can step in and help them. Well, unfortunately, price supports and bills in con Congress that would bring these price uh, supports did not pass. So this price was not guaranteed. So farmers are um, in debt because they took out loans and, and bought... Uh, um, these high-yielding crop-yielding machines on credit, and then they 
if you have this overabundance of crops where the government isn't going to step in and help them out. Okay, so that's number one, decline of industry and agriculture. That's, that's the first major cause. Uh, here is, you know, I talked about those machines that they bought on loans and could not afford to keep after. This is an auction, and this is just one of many. This is in Nebraska um, around the early 1930s. And so rather than, you know, losing out totally, they had to sell their, their tractors, their machines, for a little, little bit of money to get that money back to pay part of the loan off. Again, they weren't making it all the way up because you had interest and you had a decline in value of the machine as you started using it. But they had to sit there and sell things. Someone said sell their car to make money. Was that you? That's what these farmers were trying to do. And they weren't making enough still with that. Okay? Uh, the, next, the next bullet, consumer credit. This is the second cause. And this one I'm not going to go over too much because we kind of talked about it in, the, in the, the last section. But there's that false prosperity. And a lot of that came from people thinking that um, individuals were wealthy. And it's because you know, we saw a lot of people buying these appliances these new manufactured products, and a lot of people buying these status symbols that showed, hey, I got the money. Well, just like the farmers, these purchases were done on credit. So they didn't really have the money. They had a promise to pay that money. And eventually, all these expensive products and this way of living made it really e easy for individual debt to build out. Individual debt is just simply the debt that a person has uh, consumer hands due to, the, to their purchases. And we saw a lot of this in the, in the uh, recession we had about five years ago, right? We saw people trying to buy homes with rates and, and uh, um, payments that were too, excuse me, too much for them. I'll let you give you some time to finish jotting that down. But this is all adding to that bubble, right? And it's kind of related to the, to the cause we talked about. And it's going to be related to the one we'll talk about next. But you can see how people are really thinking that the economy is doing well, that people are, are, are rich, um, and actually it's kind of that false prosperity. Do you have two? Uh, the third one, unequal distribution of income, which we can kind of relate to today. So again, this goes with the false prosperity that people were assumed that Americans were, were doing well because they had all these products, when in fact only the top 1%, there's that 1% we hear about all the time now, we're seeing an actual huge increase in their income. And this gap means that a lot of middle class Americans and lower class Americans were actually falling short. Eventually, those people who fell short couldn't afford to purchase products. They couldn't afford to buy manufactured goods or um, um, any high end appliances or anything like that, which again led to the decline of manufacturing. So you, these guys, these are all kind of related in a certain way. Um, but there's some stats for you right there. Uh, the minimum wage at that time was 2500 a year, and 70% of Americans earned up to that or below it, which is pretty huge. Think about that now, 70% of Americans earning eight fifteen an hour. right? That's not prosperity. That's that, that large amount, the uh, percentage of the wealthy um, kind of showing a prosperity that's not there. You guys don't have to write too many of those stats down. Just get, get the idea. There was that income gap, and it was falsely represented with the success of uh, American economy in the 20s. This one, this is the, uh, the big one. And again, it's not the sole, the sole reason, uh, the sole cause for the Great Depression, but what the stock market crash did, it accelerated the Depression. At this time, we already saw a decline in the values of stocks and that sort of thing in the stock market. Uh, and then we'll get to Black Tuesday in a second, which actually made things worse. Has anyone here actually, like, have ever bought a stock before? Or bought stocks? I actually knew, I knew a kid in, in my high school who, he was a senior. He played the stock market. He had, like, thousands of dollars by the time he graduated. You, I'm, and, yeah, you had to be 18 to, to purchase that. But once he hit 18, he learned how to, how to really play it right and, um, one difference between him and these people, how to do it without the high risk. Isn't it better to buy like the, the American companies like Apple? And like it, it's better. You ever hear you're like buy low, sell high? Yeah. So what that means is like so stocks are shares of a company, um, and the more successful you are, the higher value each individual share is, right? So if you buy a company that's just kind of getting there and they have a lower value for their shares and you buy a bunch of them, 
and then they become successful and the values of the shares rise. So maybe they, you, when you bought them, they were 10 bucks a share and they go to 20 bucks. You just doubled your money, right? And it's kind of what these people saw. Um, uh, it says after the 1920s, I should have said after 1920, during the 20s, the stock market was a bull market, which just means it was rising. Bull market means rising. That one you want, you want to mark down. Um, and people saw the stock market as an easy way to make money. And just like consumer credit we just talked about, they saw it as a quick way to get the status that, that they wanted. But what they didn't do is they didn't purchase the right way. You see the term buying on margin? And what that means is, essentially, they took their money to buy stocks out through loans. They were buying stocks with money they didn't actually have. Now, what you just asked about, isn't it better to have a higher, you know, a, a successful company, right? Like Apple or something. If you bought, took a bunch of money to put money into Apple, and then something happened where, like, you know, I don't know, the iPhone 6s were bending or something. I don't know. That actually happened a little bit. But where the value of that stock declined, you're losing all that money. How do you pay back that loan? And that's the problem with buying on margin. That's the problem they saw. Speculation is the idea of them putting all their money into this high reward but high risk way of making money. Right? They saw, well, the market's a bull market. It's rising right now. Might as well put my money into it because then I'll make all this money without thinking about the risk. That bubble was there, ready to pop, and these people were being pretty reckless with their money. And we start seeing the stock market... It becomes less of a, you know, a group of people who really knew the industries and more like people betting their money, all right, their investments. And at the same time, and this even happens today, you put your money into a bank. I think I mentioned this later in the next slide. The banks are investing your money in things like stocks, okay? So the banks have other people's money who aren't even in the stock market because people with stocks right now, it's a low percentage. It's under 20 percentage of Americans, by far. You do? Awesome. I'm not going to honor that with a, another question. But uh, um, not only that, but regular people, the banks are putting their money into that. And so throughout the, uh, throughout the month of September 1929, we see, but actually, got, don't write this down yet. I'm going to go to this graph here, Okay. If you can see, right about, right about here, right where it starts to rise, that's around 1920. So you can see how the values of these, of the average shares. This is, um, pretty sure it's Dow Jones Industrial Average. Uh, if you guys didn't learn about that, Dow Jones is just a group of, I think is it 30 or 50? It's group. It's a group of the top companies, and they take the average price of their share. And if those companies are doing well, it probably means good, a good thing for the economy. So you can see, in the 20s, the, the average value skyrockets, right? It happens really fast. And that's the prosperity that people saw happening. And they thought things were going well, and they started putting their money, right, in, with speculation, started investing their money in the stock market. Um, and you can see October 1929, more specifically October 29th, that is Black Tuesday, okay? That's one of those dates in history... You, you'll always remember, because it was just a bunch of people panicked, and I'll explain why in a bit. But you can actually see where October 29th is pointing to, there was already a, a decline, right? You can see how the slope's already going down from early September. Okay, so back to this page here. People saw this decline, and they started, you know what, I'm going to sell my stock, get out of there be before it gets too low to where I lose too much money. Okay. And the stock market, it's a living, breathing thing. So as people are backing out, the value goes down even more. And we have this problem where people are backing out so much. On Black Tuesday, 16.4 million shares, not million dollars, million shares were sold of people who wanted to get rid of their stock because they believed it was going downhill. And you've got to remember, because the value was dropping, they were selling stock for less than what they had, the money they had put in. Okay, buying on margin, this means people are already losing money. By mid-November, so just a couple weeks later, investors lost a total of $30 billion in the stock market. And 
I don't know what the equivalent is to today, but that's the amount that America spent on World War I. Just America. To me, that's huge. In two weeks, people lost that much amount of money. And like I mentioned, the banks also invested people's money into the system. Um, they lost that money. So by the next year, 1933, or sorry, 1930, 12,000 out of the 25,000 banks in America closed. And guess what? You couldn't get your money back. You couldn't. There was no insurance on your deposits. We'll talk about that later on. But you were stuck with the fact that the bank lost your money. You couldn't do anything about it. So people were losing their personal money um, through stocks, losing their money through banks' investments in the stock market, and things weren't looking very good. Let's give you a couple more seconds to write this, and then we'll get, get into consequences. So just a quick review of those four causes. We had, should have written this down, but we had the decline of ag- uh, industry and agriculture. Um, you had to think. We had uh, consumer credit, so people buying things on credit, creating that false prosperity, that bubble. We had the um, uh, unequal distribution of wealth, which created, again, a false sense of success, economic su- success. And then finally, what burst the bubble was this falling decline of the stock market, uh, people bailing out of their, of their uh, shares, and then the banks failing as well. Does anyone need time on the slide? Perfect. All right, we already visited that. You can see the dip all the way down to 1932, how, how bad it got, but it's because it happened so fast and people had invested their money into what they thought was going to be a rising market that made it so devastating. Okay, so past causes, we're going to get into some consequences as far as we can before the bell. Um, I've structured this just like before. I'm going to highlight these three areas, but talking about the rural areas, so more like farming, agricultural, and then in cities, and then finally in family life. And the family life will focus on the roles of certain people within the family and how those kind of change. Give a couple seconds to write this down.